Welcome to another episode of 8-Bit Keys. Today I'm going to be taking a look at the Fisher-Price I Can Play keyboard. I actually briefly featured this keyboard last year on my other channel, The 8-Bit Guy. When I did a road trip test of the BMW i3, I stopped at a Goodwill store in Waco, Texas, and I happened to stumble across this keyboard. I had no idea what it was, but I could tell that apparently it connected to a television, and that got me really interested. So for 10 bucks, I decided to buy it and take it home with me. When I got it home and tried to turn it on, this is all it would do. The power light would flash and then nothing. No other buttons would do anything at all. After downloading a PDF copy of the manual, I noticed a little note that said a software cartridge must be inserted into the keyboard in order for piano play to function. So I'm thinking, software cartridge? Upon further examination, I realized that it does indeed have a cartridge port on the back. So I had to go online and buy something in order to test it out. I found a cheap auction on eBay for these three cartridges as a lot. I think I spent another 10 bucks on this. Anyway, so I'll try sticking one of them in. I decided to try the uh, piano play mode first. So apparently this is the only way to use the keyboard with the internal speakers and have free use of the keyboard to play whatever you want on it. But one of the first problems I ran into is there just aren't enough keys and I kept running out of keys either at the top end or the bottom end. No matter what I tried to play, I always wound up running out of keys, either on the right or the left. The instrument select button does not do anything in this mode. In fact, none of the buttons on this keyboard do anything, except the volume knob, that's about it. Well, let's hook it up to a TV now and see what it does. I'll use the Dora the Explorer cartridge. Dora the Explorer Musical Adventure! Press the enter button to play a song with me. Or use the arrow button. Okay, to well, pick some I'll pick songs. songs. Okay, let's try the backpack song. Sadly, I'm all too familiar with Dora because I used to watch this with my daughter when she was little. Level one. Here's the first note. Ready? I was going to say that this reminded me of the games on the Miracle Keyboard, but those involved an actual musical staff, requiring you to actually like learn to read music. This on the other hand is just telling you which keys to press. It's more similar to Guitar Hero. And I guess there's nothing wrong with that. I noticed that uh, on level 1 it isn't really the whole song in detail. It just seems to focus on the key changes and like a really primitive version. You can hit this left-right button, which will then teach you to play the left-hand part of the song. So, the sad part is, I actually did really bad this first time, and yet Dora is congratulating me. So, I tried it again, and just totally hit random keys. Surely it would have a reason to scold me for doing such a horrible job, right? On the contrary. Muy bien! Look at your score! I'm still praised for doing such a great job. And I'm not even sure how I earned 15%. You know, so that's something I didn't like right off the bat. I mean, this thing must have been programmed just for millennials. I mean, you know the joke about everybody getting a trophy just for participating. Well, that's kind of what this does. I mean, seriously, Dora should be saying something like, you stink, you should try harder. But it doesn't really give people any incentive to try harder. Well, let's move on and try this cartridge, Piano Favorites. Okay, so this one is, uh, it seems a little less kid-like. Piano Favorites. Press the enter button to games. Let's try games. Road trip. So apparently this is another game trying to teach you to quickly find the colors that are marked on the keys, but I have yet to figure out exactly why this is an important skill, at least outside of this device. On the bright side, I'm a bit colorblind, but I can at least still differentiate all of the colors on this keyboard. Great start. So I decided to try playing some songs. I picked Fury Lease, since uh, that should be easy. Level one. I already know how to play that song. Level two. Oddly enough, I had trouble with the song trying to watch Go, the screen and play show. despite knowing how to play the song. I'm sure I would have gotten better with practice. So here's another freestyle section. I thought I'd give it a try. Improvise. Try these keys. They'll sound great with the music. Uh, 
Okay, let's have a look at the Pop Hits cartridge. It's time to hit the top of the pop chart! Press the enter button to play a pop song. Or use the arrow button to songs. Wow, there is a mix of music from the 80s all the way to the 2000s on here. Behind these hazel eyes. Why not? I picked Celebration, Beautiful which is soul. actually, that's from 1979. Celebration. One. Anyway, I picked Check the easy out. section, Here's so this isn't too hard at all. But uh, I'm still not doing perfect, and I'm curious to see what kind of reaction the game is going to give me at the end. Will it praise me or criticize me? You sure know your pop music. Check out your score. Well, I guess I did surprisingly well. So I started over, only this time I let my cat do all of the playing. I wonder what score she will get. You're starting to sound cool. Check out your score. Press any so it sounds cool, huh? Well, at least these games do actually quantify your work and give you a score, but they certainly need to cut back on the praise. Well, so there you have it. Um, you know, I actually thought about not even doing an episode on this keyboard once I got the cartridges and saw what it was, because it was just a little bit too kiddy for me. And I mean, I should have realized that with the Fisher-Price brand name on it. But it is pretty cool, though, having a keyboard with a video output. In fact, it really got me wondering why there have not been any keyboards like during the 80s and 90s that had a video output. I mean, most of those keyboards already had basically a whole computer inside of them anyway. You'd think that it wouldn't be that much trouble to add a video chip and a video output so that the keyboards can do some, you know, on-screen stuff. So I'm actually pretty disappointed in this device. I mean, not only as a learning device for adults, obviously, but, you know, even as a learning device for kids and you know, I think the problem is is that the software is so infantile that it really only appeals to kids maybe aged three to six, maybe eight years old tops. And that demographic is the least likely to really spend the effort to try to actually learn something in the first place when it comes to music, you know, like this. And so that brings me to part number two, which is, you know, even if they did manage to learn something, they can't really play it or show it off very well because of problem number two, which is that as a standalone keyboard, this thing actually really stinks. So besides the fact that it really needs an extra octave so that you have room to actually play something, you know, it only has the one instrument and it doesn't even really sustain properly when you hold the keys down. I mean, the piano will only play for about a second or two and, and that's it. Nevertheless, it's a cool concept, and you know, I'd love to see something low cost like this aimed at the teen and adult market. And even though there was the Miracle Keyboard that came out during the 90s, and it was sorta aimed at that market, it was unfortunately quite a bit on the expensive side. I decided to take this thing apart because I wanted to have a look inside. So I removed all of the screws I could find. Unfortunately, it still refused to come apart. It seemed as if there was still a screw somewhere in the middle of the keyboard, but I couldn't find it. I began to suspect that there was a screw hidden under this green plastic bezel, but I didn't have any luck removing it. It appeared glued down or something. But my theory was that there was a screw right in the middle, right here. So I decided to drill a hole and see what I could find. Unfortunately, I didn't find anything other than black plastic. So I tried with all of my strength to just yank it apart, but failed. Then I began to wonder if maybe there was a screw hidden under this cardboard overlay sticker. However, I couldn't find anything. Then more pulling, still no luck. I decided it was time for the screen plastic to go away and I realized that I had a leverage point now. Once I broke it loose, I could see that there was some sort of screw stock there that used to be connected and I can even see a little metal screw inside of it. Maybe this was the key. Nope, I still couldn't pull this thing apart. This was really getting on my last nerve. I decided to explore some more under this sticker. I even used a screwdriver trying to see if there were any recessions where screws might be hiding, but nothing. I decided at this point that my desire to see the inside of this thing was stronger than my desire to preserve a $10 item I had bought. So I'm getting inside this thing no matter what. Unfortunately, breaking those keys still did not reveal anything. By this point, I'm far more curious about the construction and how they're keeping me from opening it than what was actually inside of it. 
but playtime is over. I'm going to win. Normally, I'm pretty good about taking things apart and putting them back together, but there will be no reassembly of this thing. This is more like an autopsy at this point. To my frustration, this bottom piece still wouldn't come off. Something was holding it from the inside. So time for a little more cutting so I can see what's going on in there. So finally, I can see some more screw stalks that were coming down from the inside, but it still won't come apart, which means that there has to be something from this side that's holding it down. But where the heck are the screws? Time to start dissecting the top of this thing. I still can't get it open, but I can see a small screw stalk below the surface. Maybe if I peel back more of the sticker? Nope, nothing. Well, I'll just cut the stalk and see if that helps. Nope, but in doing so, I did notice another screw stalk over here. So I'm gonna scrape some more of the sticker away and sure enough, look at that. There's the hidden screw I've been looking for. I had suspected it was under here early on. I was just off by a few inches of where I thought it would be. This pretty much confirms to me that Fisher-Price never planned to have any surfacing done to these keyboards because opening it up requires damaging the product. Actually, I uncovered another one over here on this side, and finally it opens. And what do we have inside? Well, there's just a single tiny logic board in here. It's actually pretty amazing that everything fits into basically a single epoxy blob integrated circuit. No wonder they didn't plan on servicing these. There's really no serviceable parts inside. Interestingly enough, the ROM cartridges are easy to open. Just four screws and it comes right apart. And there's just a single epoxy blob in here as well. So definitely nothing of interest to look at here. Well, I hope you at least enjoyed this episode and found it somewhat entertaining. And uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.